Chapter 8, Part 1 of The Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Outscheller. Chapter 8 The Mountain Battle. Part 1 General Jackson and several of his senior officers were examining the valley with glasses, but Harry, with eyes trained to the open air and long distances, could see clearly nearly all that was going on below. He saw a movement among the masses of men in blue, and he saw officers on horseback galloping along the banks of the river. Then he saw cannon in trenches with their muzzles elevated toward the heights, and he knew that the Union troops must have had warning of Jackson's coming, and he saw, too, that the officers below also had glasses through which they were looking. There was a sudden blaze from the mouth of one of the cannon. A shell shot upward, whistling and shrieking, and burst far above their heads. Harry he heard pieces of falling metal striking on the rocks behind them. The mountains sent back the cannon's roar in a sinister echo. A second gun flashed, and again the shell curved over their heads. But Jackson paid no heed. He was still watching intently through his glasses. "'The enemy is up and alert,' whispered St. Clair to Harry. "'I judge that these are western men.' used to sleeping with their eyes open. Like as not a lot of them are Mountain West Virginians, said Harry. They're strong for the North, and it is likely, too, that they're the men who have discovered Jackson's advance. And they mean to make it warm for us. Listen to those goods. It's hard shooting aiming at men on heights, but it shows what they could do on level ground. Jackson presently retired with his officers, and Harry, parting from his friends of the Invincibles, went with him. Back among the ridges all the troops were under arms, the weary ones having risen from their blankets which were now tied in rolls on their backs. They had not yet been able to bring the artillery up the steeps. Harry saw that the faces of all were eager as they heard the thunder of the guns in the valley below. Among the most eager, was a regiment of Georgians arrived but recently with the reinforcements. Many of the men, speaking from the obscurity of the crowded ranks, did not scorn to hurl questions at their officers. Are we going to fight the Yankees at last? I'd rather take my chances with the bullets than march any more. Lead us down and give us a chance at them. Colonel Leonidas Talbot and Lieutenant Colonel Hector St. Hilaire were among the officers who had gone with Jackson to the verge of the cliff, and now, when they heard the impertinent but eager questions from the massed ranks, they looked at each other and smiled. It was not according to West Point, but these were recruits, and here was enthusiasm which was a pearl beyond price. General Jackson beckoned to Harry and three other young staff officers. "'Take glasses,' he said. "'Go back to the verge of the cliff and watch for movements on the part of the enemy. If any is made, be sure that you see it and report it to me at once.' The words were abrupt, sharp, admitting of no question or delay, and the four fairly ran. Harry and his comrades lay down at the edge of the cliff and swept the valley with their glasses. The great guns were still firing at intervals of about a minute. The gunners could not see the southern troops drawn back behind the ridges, but Harry believed that they might be guided by signals from men on opposite slopes. But if signalmen were there, they were hidden by the forest even from his glasses. The smoke from the cannon was gathering heavily in the narrow valley, so heavily that it began to obscure what was passing there in the northern army. But the four, remembering the injunction of Jackson, a man who must be obeyed to the last and minutest detail, 
still sought to pierce through the smoke both with the naked eye and with glasses. As a rift appeared, Harry saw a moving mass of men in blue. It was a great body of troops, and the sun shining through the rift glittered over bayonets and rifle barrels. They were marching straight toward a slope which led at a rather easy grade up the side of the mountain. "'They're not waiting to be attacked. They're attacking!' cried Harry, springing to his feet and running to the point where he knew Jackson stood. Jackson received his news, looked for himself, and then began to push on the troops. A shout arose as the army pressed forward to meet the enemy who were coming so boldly. "'We ought to beat them, as we have the advantage of the heights,' exclaimed Sherbert, who was now on foot. But the advantage was the other way. Those were staunch troops who were advancing men of Ohio and West Virginia, and while they were yet on the lower slopes, their cannon firing over their heads swept the crest with shot and shell. The eager southern youths, as invariably happens with those firing downward, shot too high. The northern regiments, now opening with their rifles and taking better aim, came on in splendid order. "'What a magnificent charge!' Harry heard Sherburne exclaim. The rifles by thousands were at work, and the unceasing crash sent echoes far through the mountains. The southerners at the edge of the cliff were cut down by the fire of their enemy from below. Their loss was now far greater than that of the north, and their officers sought to draw them back from the verge to a ridge where they could receive the charge just as it reached the crest and pour into them their full fire. The eager young regiment from Georgia refused to obey. "'Have we come all these hundreds of miles from Georgia to run before the Yankees?' they cried, and stood there pulling trigger at the enemy, while their own men fell fast before the bitter northern hail. Harry, too, was forced to admire the great resolution and courage with which the northern troops came upward, but he turned away to be ready for any command that Jackson might give him. The general stood by a rock, attentively watching the fierce battle that was going on, but not yet giving any order. But Harry fancied that he saw his eyes glisten as he beheld the ardor of the troops. A detachment of Virginians, posted in the rear, seeking a break in the first line, rushed forward without orders, filled the gap, and came face to face with the men in blue. Harry thought he saw Jackson's eyes glisten again, but he was not sure. The crash of the battle increased fast. The southern troops had no artillery, but as the northern charge came nearer the crest, their bullets ceased to fly over the heads of their enemies, but struck now in the ranks. The ridges were enveloped in fire and smoke. A fresh southern regiment was thrown in, and the valiant northern charge broke. The brave men of Ohio and West Virginia although they fought desperately and encouraged one another to stand fast, were forced slowly back down the slope. Harry and a half-dozen others beside him heard Jackson say, apparently to himself, The battle will soon be over. Harry knew instinctively that it was true. He had got into the habit of believing everything Jackson said. The end came in fifteen minutes more, and with it, came the night. The soldiers in their ardor had not noticed that the long shadows were creeping over the mountains. The sun had already sunk in a blood-red blur behind the ridges, and as the men in blue slowly yielded the last slope, darkness which was already heavy in the defiles and ravines swept down over the valley. Jackson had won. But his men had suffered heavily, and moreover, he had stood on the defense. He could not descend into the valley in the face of the northern resistance, which was sure to be fierce and enduring. The northern cannon were beginning to send curving shells again over the cliffs. Sinister warnings of what the Virginians might expect if they came down to attack. 
Harry and the other staff officers peering over the crest saw many fires burning along the banks of the river. Milroy seemed to be still bidding Jackson defiance. Harry saw no preparations for a return assault. Jackson was inspecting the ground, but his men were going over the field, gathering up the wounded and burying the dead. The Georgians had suffered terribly, most of all for their rash bravery, and the whole army was subdued. There was less of exuberant youth and more of grim and silent resolve. Harry worked far into the night, carrying orders here and there. The moon came out and clothed the strange and weird battlefield in a robe of silver. The heavens were sown with starshine, but it all seemed mystic and unreal to the excited nerves of the boy. The mountains rose to two, three times their real height, and the valley in which the northern fires burned became a mighty chasm. It was one o'clock in the morning before Jackson himself left the field and went to his headquarters at a little farmhouse on the plateau. His faithful colored servant was waiting for him with food. He had not touched any the whole day, but he declined it, saying that he needed nothing but sleep. He flung himself, booted and clothed, upon a bed and was sound asleep in five minutes. There was a little porch on one side of the house, and here Harry, who had received no instructions from his general, camped. He rolled himself in his cavalry cloak, lay down on the hard floor, which was not hard to him, and slept like a little child. He was awakened at dawn, as one often is, by a presence, even though that presence be noiseless. He felt a great unwillingness to get up. That was a good floor on which he slept, and the cavalry cloak wrapped around him was the finest and warmest that he had ever felt. He did not wish to abandon either, but Will triumphed. He opened his eyes and sprang quickly to his feet. Stonewall Jackson was standing beside him, looking intently toward the valley. The edge of a blazing sun barely showed in the east, and in the west all the peaks and ridges were yet in the dusk. Morning was coming in silence. There was no sound of battle or the voices of men. "'I beg your pardon. I feel that I have overslept myself,' exclaimed Harry. "'Not at all,' said Jackson, with a slight smile. "'The others of the staff are yet asleep. "'You might have come inside. "'A little room was left on the floor there.' "'I never had a better bed, and I never slept better.' "'The general smiled again and gave Harry an approving glance. "'Soldiers, especially boys, learn quickly to endure any kind of hardship,' he said. Come, we'll see if the enemy is still there. Harry fancied from his tone that he believed Milroy gone, but knowing better than to offer any opinion of his own, he followed him toward the edge of the valley. The picket saluted as the silent figures passed. The sun in the east was rising higher over the valley. In the west, the peaks and ridges were coming out of the dusk. The general carried his glasses slung over his shoulder, but he did not need them. One glance into the valley, and they saw that the army of Milroy was gone. It had disappeared, horse, foot, and guns, and Harry now knew that the long row of campfires in the night had been a show, but only a brave show after all. The whole southern army awoke and poured down the slopes. Yes, Milroy, not believing that he was strong enough for another battle, had gone down the valley. He had fought one good battle, but he would reach Banks before he fought another. The southern troops felt that they had won the victory, and Jackson sent a message to Richmond announcing it. Never had news come at a more opportune time. 
the fortunes of the south seemed to be at the lowest ebb richmond had heard the great battle of shiloh the failure to destroy grant and the death of albert sidney johnston new orleans the largest and richest city in the confederacy had been taken by the northern fleet the north was always triumphant on the water and the mighty army of mcclellan had landed on the peninsula of virginia for the advance on richmond it had seemed that the south was doomed and the war yet scarcely a year old but in the mountains the strange professor of mathematics had struck a blow and he might strike another both north and south realized anew that no one could ever tell where he was or what he might do the great force advancing by land to cooperate with mcclellan hesitated and drew back but jackson's troops knew nothing then of what was passing in the minds of men in washington and richmond they were following milroy and that commander wily as well as brave was pressing his men to the utmost in order that he might escape the enemy who he was sure would pursue with all his power he knew that he had fought with stonewall jackson and he knew the character of the southern leader sherburne brought his horses through a defile into the valley and his men now mounted led the pursuit jackson in his eagerness rode with him and harry was there too behind them came the famous foot cavalry thus pursuer and pursued rolled down the valley and harry exulted when he looked at the path of the fleeing army the traces were growing fresher and fresher jackson was gaining but there were shrewd minds in milroy's command the western men knew many devices of battle and the trail and milroy was desperately bent upon saving his force which he knew would be overwhelmed if overtaken by jackson's army now he had recourse to a singular device harry riding with captain sherburne noticed that the trees were dry despite the recent rains on the slopes of the mountains the water ran off fast and the thickets were dry also then he saw a red light in the forest in front of them general jackson saw it at the same time what is that he exclaimed it looks like a forest fire general replied sherburne you're right captain and it's growing as they galloped forward they saw the red light expand rapidly and spread directly across their path the whole forest was on fire great flames rose up the trunks of trees and leaped from bough to bough sparks flew in millions and vast clouds of smoke picked up by the wind were whirled in their faces the troop of cavalry was compelled to pause and general jackson brushing the smoke from his eyes said clever very clever milroy has put a fiery wall between us the device was a complete success the pursuing men in gray could pass around the fire at points and wait at other points for it to burn out but they lost so much time that their cavalry were able only to skirmish with the northern rear guard then when night came on melroy escaped under cover of the thick and smoky darkness end of chapter eight part one recording by bill mosley Bernardo, Texas, USA.